Sarah is going to help us set the agenda for the next little bit. Um, and I'm just, Sarah's been my partner in this project of getting this Palliative Care Institute off the ground. She calls herself Rover. Um, that's because she's our community liaison and she goes out and kind of meets with people and calls them in. She's like the, the little dog that says, oh, come on, you gotta come. Um, and I'm grateful for that energy, but also for her intellectual savvy and her passion for transforming healthcare. She teaches uh, courses on health policy and healthcare reform in the political science department at Western. And she uh, has built on years of action and research in the politics of chronic illness and aging. So my buddy, Sarah. Okay. I got a blue one. I like. Marie, thank you. I have to say that, uh, especially over the last couple of years, I haven't been able to do as much as I had hoped with PCI. Can you hear me? And that's because I discovered today I have a name for it. I'm burned out. Yeah, I am. Uh, I taught the American presidency in the fall and then moved directly to health policy in the winter. And now I'm teaching a class on serious illness. So in my work life, I've had some fairly stressful interact, you know, things to, to deal with my students on. And I also, um, uh, came through, came successfully through, and some of you may know that because I've mentioned this before, uh, a serious illness. At our conference three years ago, I knew something was wrong with me, and I'd lost weight and didn't have much energy, and I was diagnosed first with anemia, and then with a rare cancer, a sarcoma. It was right here. And uh, Jenny Cruz, who was at Peace Health at the time, diagnosed that. And I'm happy to say I had very good treatment at the Cancer Care Alliance. I took an oral drug, Gleevec, which is a wonderful drug if you can take it, if it works. It shrunk the tumor, the cancer was removed, and I finished the Gleevec about four months ago. I've been cancer free for two and a half years. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so when I went off of that mess, I mean, I was teaching full time and working and all, I had to do what we've talked about today in some ways. And that was really first to make sense of what I'd been through because I couldn't do that at the time it was happening. And then also to figure out what my life was going to be like. Now that I was three years three years older, and closer to a time where I would be reflecting and moving on with my career, I said to myself, what a lot of people don't have the luxury of saying, thanks goodness I had a regular paycheck. Because that capacity to keep track of your finances and so on, all of those things. But I mean, I needed and got palliative care. And I also have to say that it gave me, even though I have a lot on my plate right now, an incredible urgency about the importance of the work we have and the work we do. The importance of overcoming social isolation at any time, uh, at any time people are ill, the importance of, uh, of figuring out the way to give that help, even when somebody doesn't ask you or doesn't know how to ask you directly, that was so hard for me because I, I've been a department chair and the head of two or three programs. I wasn't somebody, you know, I delegated, but when it came to my personal life, I wasn't somebody that knew how to ask for help. And, and, and I downplayed my illness because I didn't want people to worry about me. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, here I am, burned out. So at any rate, uh, I, uh, I just found myself wanting to take on the things I'd been able to do before and I couldn't do it. And a lot of that is psychological as well as physical, I think. So some of the things that were talked about today for me were really, really important. I will say this. I don't know that I would have called it burnout, but um, I, I was talking to one of my friends and I started crying. 
And I said, people used to look to me in our family, and I was the stable one. And look at me now. I'm, you know, I come home at the end of the day and, and I fall apart. And my friend said, for heaven's sakes, you know, we've got to help you. You're the rock. Because that's what they call me, is the rock. And I, uh, I thought about that, and even though I didn't really feel like doing it, I went to my collection of rocks, because I do love rocks as well, and I strategically placed rocks throughout my house. At the front door, at the back door, in the kitchen, places where I could sort of experience some sadness, I put a favorite rock. And so now when I start to feel a little of that, I go over and touch that rock and say, I may not be, nobody ever will be just like they were in the past, but I still have that capacity to be strong for people and help people. But first, I have to get well. First, I have to heal and give myself a chance to do that. So it really means a lot to me to be here with you because as Marie can tell you, because really I think Marie and Casey and and, and Carol and a few people have known that I was at least close to burned out, but they figured they'd help me a little bit and that, that if I really started to go over the full burn, to full burn, they'd pull me back. Am I right? Yeah, I know. I know that now, which is a good sign, I think. But at any rate, uh, uh, this has been a wonderful conference for me. And one of the things that I sort of lost, I. I've always had the capacity to tell funny stories about death and things, and I don't mean that in a mean way, but we've always used humor in our family related to death. Some of you who may have been here before may, may recall the story I told about my sister and myself transporting our aunt after her death in the mini back of a minivan from Wisconsin to Indiana. She was in a um, cardboard, she was in bomb, and bombed, we had papers, but she was in a, a cardboard coffin, and she fit perfectly in the back of the minivan. And, and I guess my favorite line from that story is that she was a wonderful traveler. <laughs> um, she had not been. She'd been gotten so, like many people, she was a horrible backseat driver. And uh, you know, it was really on us. And she was the head of the family. I mean, we, you know, we're like the mafia in a way. We always have a head of the family. But at any rate, that was Aunt Donna. And so uh, even though she had dementia, if you mentioned money, for example, she'd say, no, 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 come over here. We have to talk about that privately. A little like the Godfather, but, uh, but, uh, but not with the draconian means, I might add. But at any rate, um, so before, before we recap today, I'll tell you that uh, a story about my mother's death. My mother was a wonderful golfer. At 75, she hit a hole in one. Yes, and she was so sure that no one would believe her because of her age that she had other people come over and, and witness it. On the golf course, shortly after that, she started getting memory loss. Not awful, really, but she couldn't live on her own. And um, subsequently, she lived in a, she lived in a life care community until the last two months of her life, and. Then she had a hard couple months, but really was not, it was much harder on us than it was on her, I would say. And um, so when she died, um, we, 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 she was cremated and, and uh, my sister first of all suggested that, I said, well, you know, we're gonna have them open the grave next to daddy tomorrow after the service. And she said, can we just go out there at night and dig a little hole and empty those ashes in? And, and you know, we can you give that money to some good cause. And then I had a dream. We've heard about dreaming today, right? In the dream, mother came to me and she said, I want to be treated like your father. And I said to my sister, I've already called, I've already called and the grave will be opened. And I said, I will never, you know, this, was, this dream was not something I needed to write down. It was very clear. So uh, uh, at any rate, I just couldn't imagine. Well, I mean, we did drive my aunt. So in some ways, I could imagine us doing that. But uh, we didn't do that. But when, there were two parts of this, I'll tell you. We had a service. 
And um, uh, I knew, as did my sister, that my mother's cremated remains had not arrived as yet. So we had a little place for them. And people came up and said, oh, I can feel her in there and things like that. And I felt really, you know, I just didn't want to retell the story every time because I knew in spirit she was there. But during the luncheon, after the minister had left, her cremated remains arrived. And so I got up and I announced to the group, mother is here. <laughs> and they were all like, huh? I mean, but you know, they were a little old because they knew about Aunt Donna and her travels with us. So I uh, said, her well, her cremated remains have just arrived. And I said, so let's all go out to the gravesite and bury her in the fashion she'd want to be buried. So we got one of those golf carts they drive around. And my friend drove it, and my sister and I got on the back with our mother's ashes. And so she was driven on the back of a golf cart out to the gravesite. And then we all gathered around, because I'm from Indiana, and we sang back home again in Indiana. And one of the sweet parts of it was the person who had opened the grave was there. And uh, he, uh, he was a person that had beautiful tattoos all over his body. And uh, he was kind of big. And, and uh, I looked at him, and he, you know, I had handed him the box. And he handled it so gently. And he said, I'm going to bend over now and put your mother in next to your dad. And I always remember, I always remember what I, uh, you know, I sort of learned from that experience of him looking like he was really big and strong and tough, and yet he was so fragile and kind with her. And when I think of her, when I think of her passing, I always think of him as part of that. But I, but I love, I love that we could take her out on a golf cart. I know that's the way she'd want to go. So anyway, that's my family story for today. And I will say that again that that uh, Aunt Donna, I think it was the thing to do. I think the thing to do was to drive her home. And at first, I didn't want to do it. But then I realized that being close to her at the end was something that actually meant a lot to me. And with both of them, it was a way for us to have an ending that was joyful with them and that was like, like our lives had been with them. So anyway, that, that's my story, and I, I feel a little less burned out now that I've told you that. I have to tell you that. So uh, what I really want from you, I've told you what I've taken away from this day, which are really important things, and I have some steps I'm going to take when I go home to do more self-care and to... Uh, uh, I have a friend that's coming up this weekend. I went to graduate school with her. I haven't seen her in 15 years. There was part of me because of the isolation that comes with the way I feel that wanted to say no to her, but I didn't do it. And so at any rate, uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's a good sign. But what I'd like to know if just a few people, not everybody, just sort of shout out some things that you've taken away from today. Anybody? Any takeaway messages? Okay, I'm going to work more beauty into my life. That's wonderful. More on to being than to doing. I see both of these things as being really important, both in self-care and in that capacity to give to others. One or two more. Wise compassion. Wise compassion. These are wonderful. Pursuit of wholeness. Remember to be mindful, purposeful pause. All of these are, are, are really important. Take time to be creative. 
I actually brought one of the empathy cards back with me because I liked it so much. I was trying to figure out whether I could use a stamp to create a tattoo on my hand, but they don't work for that, I'll tell you. Uh, but uh, So I want to tell you some of the things that we have done, and when I say we, I mean usually, uh, loosely, I mean Marie and the team under Marie's leadership have done this. We have not only put on this conference, but a number of programs that focus on uh, on, with the library system on literature for young people who have had loss or death in their families and among friends. These are workshops and they've been all over the county. We've worked in conjunction, in conjunction with others on getting more people to sign up for advanced directives. And we've supported uh, the programs that talk about what it's really like in the ICU and really place significance on having that advanced direction. Uh, the work of many, many people in this room. Uh, we have developed that website, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource for the community. Marie, name another thing. Legacy letters. Legacy letters where people write what they would want you to know, what, what they would want others to know about them when, they, when they've died, what their legacy would be. The back of the bus campaign. Uh, I have to say that I think you have a picture of the back of the bus, and I have to take credit for that because that's my photo. I was in traffic in Fairhaven, and I looked in front of me and I said, wow, there's our sign. <laughs> So I got my phone out and snapped a picture, picture of it that says, I think it says, Death Happens. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, when we first started, we did talking sessions, and then we did a three-day conference. It was kind of a one-time, you know, one-year thing with maybe another little program or two. But now, we have really moved out into the community. Lots of other things. And so it's important for us to know what you would like to help us take forward. And I should say, we have a little money. What I mean by that is we have micro grants, the empathy cards, the back of the bus campaign, the early idea for the website, all of these came from people like you that came to these conferences, had an idea, wrote a little proposal, to our steering committee, and we gave $1,000 or something around that to get it started. So we want lots of community buy-in. Do you have ideas? Do you want to talk for a minute, or does anybody have an idea they'd have in mind? Yes? A day in the dead celebrates your outreach to the Spanish-speaking community about Okay, great. Would you like for me to repeat that? A Day of the Dead Spanish-speaking outreach, or Spanish-speaking in the Spanish language for the Spanish community and for others also to learn. That's wonderful. And, and uh, of course, this is what I my students raise their hand and say something, and then I say, would you like to work on that? <laughs> ah, okay, could we work with you? Oh, good. Don't be afraid to raise your hand if you don't want to work on it. Aurora? I think that um, might be a good idea to include young people to the advanced directives. So if you have an advantage Webster or um, uh, somehow part of the young people. Mm -hmm. So the just in case program really be more proactive about that? Or, or also be in a position where they, they can't imagine it, but that they have to make life decisions for a parent or friend at a young age. I think a lot of us had to do that without much direction. These are great ideas. Other ideas? Yes. Yes. Flip. 
There's a program called Hand in Hand Parenting out of Palo Alto, California, that sets up, facilitates creation of listening pairs for parents where they'll, they'll help two people find each other and set up a relationship to trade time listening to one another. They train people in how to do it and they do guidelines and they do assistance for that. And I don't see why there could not be such a program set up for caregivers. Thank you. So I know some of you in the past have raised what I think is, you know, is, is something very reasonable. And that is that uh, Bellingham is not all of Whatcom County. And so I'm wondering, I'm wondering whether uh, there are ideas about things we might do in the county that would really broaden our focus beyond the, we do some, some programming in the county, but, but things we could do in the county that would really broaden the focus of our program. Ideas? Casey? Great. I saw another idea from here. So that's a good segue to uh, the question I was going to ask. So how many people in this room are from Whatcom County? How many people from Whatcom County? Wow, okay, so mostly. And how many uh, are from outside of Whatcom County? Okay, so some significant numbers. But um, so... A lot of times I come to this conference and I think, wow, there's such a wealth up here and how do we translate this for elsewhere? And so the church's ideas is one way to bridge that. Um, another thing, it, you know, trying to do palliative care uh, sort of in isolation that, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I don't want to speak out of turn about an idea that's coming up um, about, well, the Physicians Academy. That would be, you know, training um, other people. We, the likelihood of getting a palliative certified physician part time in other facilities or smaller facilities is really small. So um, training other team members who can promote the principles and practices so we don't feel so alone trying to do this. So, um, however, that might happen. Do I see any more hands? Well, I think that these are all great ideas. I think that one of the things that uh, that I'm I'm most pleased about in terms of, of it's a start, but I think it's an important start. Uh, over the last year, in particular, uh, through this, the uh, showing, for example, of the Spanish language version of being mortal. Uh, in Skagit County, and uh, uh, bringing uh, cultural competent cultural competence for Latina and Hispanic people. We had an event on that, and with with a, a diversity. I don't really like the word diversity, but with the with with speakers who come from different perspectives, I think we have more work we can do in this area. But I also am really pleased that uh, that. We are beginning to uh, to really have a focus that looks at not uh, not just 
uh, that looks at all communities that live in this area. And I think that that's very important for our work. Uh, I think we have a lot ahead of you, uh, a lot ahead of us. And um, when I came today, I said to myself, and, and this is not a funny story, but it does have a good end, ending, I think. Um, I said to myself, I know when I go to this conference that I will be with people and that there are more people who couldn't be here who are like me in this regard. Because I'm someone who, who will always go to and never look away. And what I mean by that is that I'll tell you, uh, so, you know, uh, God made the world round so we wouldn't see what's ahead of us. Is a famous line from out of Africa. I was driving back from the lake on Monday and I saw a car pulled over to the side of the road and uh, a woman's legs were hanging out. And so I pulled up and I said to the man, do you need help? And he said, I do. And so I pulled over and uh, he was trying to give her CPR, you know, pretty ineffectively. And they had shot heroin and she had had an overdose. And uh, I mean, it was very real. We had just talked about opiates in both of my classes and uh, I am registered to do CPR. And so I said the things you're supposed to say. And I was, I have to tell you, I was pretty certain she was dead. But uh, he was stronger than me and so I told him what to do where to put his hands, and I said to him, if you break a rib, it's okay, because that's, that's how hard you need to push. And I hope that's good advice. Not, you know, not try to break a rib, but, and then, I'm not being funny about this. I mean, I am being funny, but it's true. I had just watched a retrospective on the Bee Gees. Remember the Bee Gees? Staying alive. Right, and so I said to him, he had already called 911, I should tell you that. I said to him, I'm going to count, and you follow my beat. And so I had just heard, uh, 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 staying alive. I didn't sing that, but I sang it to myself, and I clapped the beat, and then he said, I'm getting tired. And that was when I realized that he was high as well. I was getting the picture. I thought I was getting the picture, and, uh, and, I have to say, I mean, this is an awful thing, but it's increasingly ordinary as well. And so I took over briefly, and then the EMTs came and the firefighters. They were wonderful. These are people that if they wanted it, palliative, anything we could do with regard to palliative care, I would say we should do it with them. But they pulled her out. They laid her in the street, they gave her the antidote, and by golly, she came around. I could not believe it. They saved her life. Now, I don't have any idea what kind of a life she will have ahead of her, because I don't know how long she's been down, but I know that it can be pretty rare for that to work. It doesn't always work. And so, I just hope that that you will join me. Well, first of all, I we we that the, one of the EMTs said to me, "Why did you stop?" And I said to him, "Who wouldn't?" And he said, "A lot of people." And I said, "That would never be me." And and that is the thing about palliative care and caregivers. Setting a balance, we know and we've learned today, is really important. And that balance is important for us, but it's also important so that we can carry out that deepest important value of being the one that, that says, because that would never be me. I would always come. I would always stop. And that's all of you as well. So I thank you for coming and uh, for listening to me, giving us great ideas. I think we're about on time, are we, Marie? I won't sing a song because I can't. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not very good at that. Marie might give us a little something. She didn't know she was going to. But uh, 
I just want to say again, I cannot convey to you the respect and thankfulness I have for Marie's leadership. So, thank you, thank you so much for your good ideas. Um, I do want to close with a small song. Great. And uh, I, this was brought to mind by uh, Casey this morning when she held up the breathe card. So this is a little um, song that I've heard. Um, her mother taught her how to swim when she was very, very young. Swimming to survive and swimming to survive. The glide, she said, it's the most important part. You kick, and then you glide. You kick, kick, and then you glide. Keep breathing, it's the most important part. It's all in the rhythm. It's all in the rhythm. It's all in the rhythm of the heart. You can sing that with me. Keep breathing, it's the most important part. You kick, you kick. And then you glide, you kick, kick, and then you glide. Keep breathing, it's the most important part. It's all in the rhythm, it's all in the rhythm, it's all in the rhythm of the heart. One more time. Keep breathing, it's the most important part. You kick. And then you glide, you kick, kick, and then you glide. Keep breathing, it's the most important part. It's all in the rhythm, it's all in the rhythm, it's all in the rhythm of the heart. So take your beautiful hearts and go out in the sun. Thank you.